Our first scripture reading today is from the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verses 25 through 28. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now if you would please stand with me and uh, join in our gathering worship music.
with you. Now let us greet one another in Jesus' love. was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was
to invite our children to come up for our children's moment with Miss Rebecca. Good morning. So last week, I saw something pretty special. Snowflakes, yes. And so it snowed a little bit last week, didn't it? You guys see it? Yeah, so I love snowflakes, and I think they are amazing. Because did you know? that every snowflake is different. That's right, it's different. Oh yes, but I'm gonna go a little bit further than what we did in chapel, okay? So hold on, ready? Just thought we've done this before. All right, so we've got some pictures of snowflakes. Do you see this one? That's a strange looking snowflake, isn't it? It looks kind of like a dog bone or something, right? A bench, maybe? Okay, so it's a, it's a different... Yes, kind of like that. Like, yes, it looks like a scroll. They're, they're stuck together. Yes, so it's a different looking snowflake, right? I heard about that. That's so fun. So... Then I have another snowflake. This looks kind of like the snowflake that we see in the movie Frozen. Kind of the, the one that we think of when we see snowflakes. But they're all different. And I have more, but I didn't bring them with me. But every snowflake is different. There is not one that is the same. And it made me think that that's like us. God created us all different. We are unique. And we have special gifts that God gave us that we are to share with others, right? So then it made me think of this scripture, and I'm going to read it. It says, just as a body, though one has many parts, our body has lots of different parts. We have eyes, we have hands, we have feet, and they all serve a purpose, right? But all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. And so we are all different parts. But if we work together, we can do great things in Christ's name. And it made me think of this. Who is that? Olaf. Now, I love Olaf. He makes me laugh. But I want you to think about this. What is Olaf made of? Lots of snow, right? Lots of different snowflakes. And all of those snowflakes come together and they make snow. Something beautiful, something that we can enjoy. It can make them grow too, that's right. And so just like snowflakes can create snow and can create snowmen, when we work together sharing our gifts, we can create amazing things to share So like when we come together and we work and help distribute food at the food giveaway, are we coming together using our gifts to share with others? Yeah. So that's who we are. That's who we are created to be. Unique and special so that our gifts can be shared. Okay? Will you pray with me? I'm going to do an echo prayer. Loving God, thank you. For all of our unique gifts. Help us to share them. Amen.
Our second scripture this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 10, and it's verses 34 through 48. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. This is the word of God for the people of God. Good morning, church. As we get started this morning, I want us to kind of have a, a a short time of prayer together. There's two things specifically I want us to be praying for. Uh, One, yesterday morning there was a group of nine, I believe, that left from the church and went down to uh, Sager Brown uh, Disaster Relief Center in Louisiana. Uh, Bucky was on that team and led it, and there's some others that went. Uh, And they're going to be doing work down there to help that area to prepare for the next disaster, for their next response, and those kind of things. And and, uh, we should have done this last week, and Bucky and I both were like, ah, we just just slipped our mind with everything going on. But I want to pray for them and for their travels and for, uh, for... profitable time of ministry down there. Uh, The second thing uh, that I want us to pray for is tonight at six o'clock in this sanctuary is going to be a gathering of Methodist preachers and their spouses from throughout the conference from you know basically from the eastern time zone to the Tennessee River from Kentucky to Alabama and all in between um, to worship and it's just the time uh, sometimes it's hard for pastors and their families to worship on Sunday mornings because their minds are going so many directions and doing so many things so be a time just for them to let down their hair and worship here tonight. Uh, the bringing in a the, the district is sponsoring us to bringing in a pastor from South Florida uh, to uh, to preach and kind of talk about renewing our calls. And, and I just hope it's a powerful time of worship for our colleagues because when 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 you know the pastors are refreshed and renewed and filled up, it, it can't help but affect the churches around there, including this pastor in this church. Uh, and so I want us to pray for those things. So if you don't mind, just bowing with me and let's pray, God. Uh, we love you, and we thank you for how you use us. We pray, Lord, for our team that's on mission this week down in, uh, in Louisiana at Sager Brown. We pray for their continued safe travels. pray it's a profitable time of ministry that, in the work that they do in preparing for the United Methodist Church and the church to meet the needs of, of the world in the times of disaster. pray that they are changed and that their hearts are grown by the time they spend down there, and that you can bring them back to us safely. And, Lord, we pray for the time of worship tonight for the pastors and their families who will be here, that it will be a time of of refreshment, a time of rejuvenation, a time of you uh, renewing a a call in our lives, uh, and that that hearts will be transformed uh, tonight during this time of worship. So we pray your Holy Spirit would move through this place this morning and tonight both, and that people would be changed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. I also just kind of want to point ahead. Remember on the first week of the series, I talked about how uh, Jim Wallace said, in times of, of unrest like this, it's important for Christians not to go left or go right, but to go deeper. Uh, and so that's one of the things we're going to try to do uh, in 2020 as a church is to go deeper. And that's going to be reflected from the pulpit as well and how we uh, go about this sermon time. And so starting next week, 
We're not going to have a sermon uh, for the next four weeks, per se, and more of a teaching. We're going to do sort of a Bible study. We're going to uh, take and dissect the book of Jonah uh, over the next four weeks, one chapter at a time a week, and just kind of more of a teaching kind of thing. So it might be a good time for you to, to bring a Bible if you have it, or that you, if you like to underline it, or your app on your phone, you can highlight those kind of things, and we'll be looking at those things together. And then for the four weeks in March after that, we're going to be doing a sermon series on prayer to help us to go deeper in prayer. So those are two things I think will be profitable for us looking ahead. Today, though, we finish our uh, Choosing Side series, and I want to point to a text in the book of Acts that oftentimes doesn't get the, uh, the, the importance that it deserves. Uh, you know, the book of Acts is the story about the birth and growth of the church. It, it tells a story about how the church began at Pentecost and how it continued to grow and spread throughout the world to where it is today. Uh, it talks about who is to be included in the church as well. And spoiler alert, it's everybody <laughs> that's supposed to be a part of the church. Uh, and in our text for today from Acts 10, it's, a, it's a, a beautiful and amazing story that oftentimes that we just fail to give it what it deserves because it's an important text in the scripture. And the story starts, before we pick up from what we read today, with a man named Cornelius. He was a well-respected Gentile in Italy. Gentile meaning not Jewish, not a person who had been part of the covenant that God had had that he start with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all through that. Uh, it's, that's not part of his history or background. But it says that Cornelius was a man who loved and respected God and feared God and gave his tithes to God and lived a life that was pleasing to God. And God appears to him and acknowledges to him, Cornelius, you are a good man and a God-fearing man, and I want you to understand something. And so to understand it, I want you to, to seek out and to find a man named Peter. And so Cornelius sends some of his servants, some of the people that work for him, out to go and find this man, Peter, and bring him to him so he can have a conversation with him. Meantime, Peter, we learn, is traveling around telling people about Jesus and this church that had just begun. And it says he grows weary and stops to the place where he's standing. He goes up to the rooftop to pray. And while he's praying, he gets really hungry. And while he's up there praying and his, his stomach's rumbling, then all of a sudden he sees this vision from God of a big tablecloth that just descends from the heavens down and lays out in front of him. And on this tablecloth is all kinds of pork barbecue and shrimp, every kind of shrimp you can imagine, and lobster tails, and all of these things that Peter's not supposed to eat. That the Levitical laws say you're not supposed to eat from hooved animals, pigs. You're not supposed to eat from shellfish in the ocean, shrimp and lobster, all these things. And while he's there, it smells so good and it just makes him hungrier. And God says, Peter, eat. But Peter, as he's inclined to do at times, becomes very self-righteous. If you read through the Gospels, you see that Peter at times gets on his high horse, and here he is on the highest, and he says, oh, no, Lord, I would never eat of this. I would rather starve to death than be unfaithful to you. That's Ryan translation. To which God says to Peter, didn't I create these things? And if I created them, don't you think I did it perfectly? And if I created it perfectly, then who are you to say that these things are dirty? <laughs> well, that just blows Peter's mind. He can't really grasp it all. He, it's just, it's such a, a thing. That, I mean, like his parents and his grandparents and his great-grandparents and his great-great-grandparents and, and as far back as is, 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 is been known, no one has eaten of this food because they've called it dirty. And now God's saying, I made it. And it's perfect. And it's okay for you to eat. And Peter's trying to get his mind around this when all of a sudden we, we, he's interrupted by these servants from Cornelius who find Peter. And they tell him, they say, our master, Cornelius, is a Gentile who loves God and fears God. And God told him to send for you to come to him because you have a message that he needs to hear. In the midst of all of that, Peter's intrigued. 
And he follows these servants and goes and meets Cornelius. And that's sort of where we pick up our text for today. The two of them meet and begin talking, and Peter realizes this guy Cornelius is legit, which sort of continues to to blow his mind because he's a Gentile, and yet it's obvious that he loves God and has lived the God-fearing life. Cornelius asks him, what's this message that, that God says you have for me? And Peter says, let me tell you about Jesus. And he begins to share about Jesus' life, the things Jesus stood for. Tells him about the teachings of Jesus, the things that he taught them through the Sermon on the Mount and and the healings of Jesus and, and, and just how Jesus lived his life. He tells them, he says, and it drove the religious elite crazy. And so eventually they had him arrested. They put on a mock trial and they killed him. And after they killed him, they put him in a tomb and rolled a stone in front of it. But you won't believe what happened next. Three days later, I myself witnessed it. I came to the tomb early that morning, and the stone was rolled away, and the tomb was empty, and his grave clothes were folded up in a nice, neat pile, and he was hollering at me from outside. And he's alive. And he's created this new movement called the church. And it's our job to tell the whole world that Jesus has overcome death and offers us life. And he offers it to you. And you can be forgiven for your sins and your past and whatever else that you've done. That you can have and experience a new life today. And you know what happens? Cornelius receives that message. And all of the Gentiles who were around him, all of his servants, and all the people who had gathered there, they received that message. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit fell on them, and they began speaking in tongues. And and, and it was a powerful movement. There was wind, and there was flames, and Peter going, I've been here before. It's like Pentecost happening all over again. In fact, that text has become known as the Gentile Pentecost. Because what happened in Acts 2 at Pentecost was for the Jews and basically those who already knew Jesus. And what happens in Acts chapter 10 is that same gift of the Holy Spirit to be received by the Gentiles. And they received it. And in the midst of all of that, it clicked for Peter. And he says, I get it now. God shows (laughs) no partiality. God doesn't have favorites. And these people, these Gentiles, have obviously received this gift of the Holy Spirit from Jesus just the same as we have. And who are we to deny them the baptismal waters? What he means by that is to deny them membership in the Christ church. It's a powerful, powerful text. Now, I want us to step back from this from just a minute, from the text, and think about this from a big picture, because this causes a lot of problems in the church. And in fact, if you read all of the epistles, all the letters that Peter and and Paul and Mary, I mean, not Mary, um, but Peter and Paul send. (laughs) Got ahead of myself there. They're having to address issues that come up because of the differences in the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. Because you see, the Gentile Christians are messy. They didn't grow up with the knowledge that the Jewish Christians grew up with. They didn't grow up with the heritage that the Jewish Christians grew up with. They didn't grow up with an understanding and the rituals and and all those things that had been poured into them from their birth through that day. They were rough around the edges. They didn't know proper protocols of things you should do and shouldn't do. And so at times throughout the early church, as Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians come together and make up the church, in other words, the people who had been a part of God's covenant and now the rest of the world, it caused problems. And so at times there were things like this. They'd have a church potluck. And the Jewish Christians would say, Will you look at what those Gentile Christians brought? How dare they bring that stuff? They should know we're not supposed to eat that stuff. Or 
A Gentile Christian would stand up in a church council meeting and say, I have a vision for the church and for its future, to which the Jewish Christians would be like, you know, we're glad you're here and all, and we want you to pay your tithe. <laughs> but y'all just need to leave the matters of leading the church to us, those who have been around here for a while. Or, there would be times in worship where it would be so obvious to the Jewish Christians that the Gentile Christians just didn't understand the cleansing rituals associated with the worship of God, and they might get a whiff of them in worship. Oh my gosh, what is that smell? Did they not wash their clothes? Did they not wash their bodies? Did they not know that this is a time to be clean, to show honor to God? Or when they come to the Lord's table to receive communion, they may all draw back in horror as a Gentile Christian would reach out to receive communion with their left hand, which was a big no-no among Jewish Christians. Because everybody knew that, that, that you used your right hand for clean things, to shake hands. That's why we, it's protocol to offer your right hand to someone today. Because you would, you would only save it for clean things, like, like eating, like welcoming people, like receiving the Lord's Supper. And you would use your left hand for dirty things. How dare they offer their left hand to receive communion? You see my point here, right? You understand the message that I'm offering us today, right? Because sometimes us well-intentioned church folk choose sides, still today, based on how long you've been a Christian, based on how long you've been a member of a particular church or congregation, based on how old you are, or what your socioeconomics are. And that list goes on and on and on. And, and, and what we do is every time we, we create these differentials based on something, then we build a wall and, and, and we choose sides. And what that does is it isolates these who are coming into the church. Galatia, as he was dead, as we read at the neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither male nor female. For we are one in Christ. Now I can imagine if Paul were to write a similar letter to the church today, the general church around the world, he might say the very same thing but phrase it just a little bit differently. He might say, in Christ, church, there is neither black nor white. There is neither wealthy, rich, or poor. There is neither, or Tennessee Christians, young Christians, or older Christians. For we are all one in Christ. I started a statement. will prove to be a very... Those things we're seeing it lived out right now. Just turn on the TV. Also said it could be a potentially divisive year for the United Methodist Church with our general conference in May, and who knows what's going to happen there. But as I end this series, I want to say this: it doesn't have to be that way for us. In fact, I believe that we can offer the world a different picture, a different image of what the church can be. I ask you this question. Who benefits the most from that? If the church fights amongst itself, who on earth in a time on today and tomorrow, tonight and Tomorrow. All these different things, and in the midst of that, I was really feeling anxious and worried and fearful. And in the midst of that, I felt God sort of speak into my heart a scripture. It's one that we actually, I actually read it on Friday at the funeral that I was a part of. And it says this from John 14, let not your heart be troubled. 
believe in God, believe also in me, is how it begins and it ends this way. Peace I leave with you. My I give to you. Your hearts be troubled, you, my peace. I First Bible that I grabbed was the message of the original language. It has to say with this text, it says, that's my parting gift to you. Peace. I don't leave you the way you're used to being left. Feeling abandoned. Bereft. Anxious. Fearful. So don't be upset. Don't be distraught. There is one choice I want us, especially on your about what the future anxiety offers us. You lead to replacing destroy them, not once. And enter the land as one people. We have who gives us peace be to God. Our song of response will be on in your hymn on page 361. It'll be on the screens as well. The song is Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. I invite you to stand as you're able and let's sing together. Thank you for recovery for Jan, Ms. Sammy, Mr. Tommy and Ms. Teresa, Anita Farmer, Mary Howard, Chris Martin. Praise for Gloria Wicker's report. Praise for Michelle Faust, Buddy Stevens, Janet McCall, Tommy and Teresa, Chris Manison, family of Sarah Mears, Lisa Neal, Darlene Craighead, Janet McCluskey, Brian Green, the Phillips girl's mother, the Sutton family, the Stevens family, Darlene Craighead, Janet McCluskey, Gloria Wicker, Bobby Gwynn, Compassionate Hands guests and volunteers, Gail Terry, Alicia Rico, Brian Green, Betsy White, Linda S. Butterbaugh, Beavers, the Munich family, Brian Green, Together with and for each other at the Chancel Royal Team. Let us.
As we leave here this morning, may we not leave here as Jew or Greek. May we not leave here as male or female. May we not leave here as you fill in the blank of anything else that divide us, but rather may we leave here one in Christ Jesus. Go in peace. Like a wildfire in my heart Sunday morning, hallelujah No, we, it's a real You can I've got a name is still The Lord is still my sense And I believe me The whole church is fire singing in my soul I got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful I got a heart overflowing cause I've been Church. Peace out.